Hi, hope you guys are having a good Sunday. Um, and uh, welcome to my Facebook Live. And let me know in the comments if there are any issues with the video. You know, if you have trouble hearing me or anything like that. So, and I'm happy to hear from you, even if there are no issues, just to say, hey, you know, I love hearing from you. So I want to start out by saying how grateful I am to all of you. I am so grateful for your feedback and everything you write to me. Um, we had phenomenal feedback for the video that I did together with Danny and he promises to be back um, hopefully next week. He's behind the scenes running things so that I can do this, so that I can take your questions and all that. But um, I know you guys really want him, you, you know, and pretty soon he'll need to have his own show. We haven't forgotten anything that he said. He started the ball rolling on something and we're collecting all the responses we got from people who were talking about, um, who were really interested in what he said about support for those who support people with illnesses. I think that is so important because those people need to have their energy um, replenished so that they can be in good form to take care of the people they take care of. Um, so hi, Sus Sharma. Um, thank you for posting. So today, the topic I have for you today is um, um, Marianne Peterson. Hi from Denmark. Thank you. Uh, the topic is the law of attraction and the tip of the iceberg. So you're probably wondering what kind of a crazy title is that? So it's actually two little subjects and I thought I'd put them together. And uh, oh, hi Shaf. Shaf Garcia says she saw, she saw Mira Kelly at the workshop today. Hey, uh, um, love Mira Kelly. So um, thank you, Pat Wilson says she can hear me fine. Thank you, that's good to know. Um, so anyway, people sometimes write to me and say that some of the things I have said about the law of attraction um, doesn't quite align with what they believe about the law of attraction. So today I wanna clarify my views on the law of attraction because uh, at the end of the day, they say also say that even the healing, I attracted that healing because I, for whatever reason, I loved myself and I had the NDE. And, and so in the end, it is the law of attraction that worked for me. And yet I don't, uh, when, whenever people say to me, so are you saying your thoughts create your reality? And I say, no, not necessarily. I don't like to think that way. So several times I've had people ask me or write to me and say, can you reconcile your views on the law of attraction and why sometimes it sounds like you're contradicting them and sometimes it sounds like you're agreeing with the law of attraction. So this is what I want to start by doing. Um, my views on the law of attraction is that we don't attract by our thoughts, we attract by who we are at any given time. So that's the first thing I want to say to clarify. I do believe there is a law of attraction at work, but we attract by who we are. And so it's not about controlling your thoughts because controlling your thoughts makes you a little more contrived and controlled and it doesn't allow you to be who you are. And when you're controlling your thoughts, you're judging your thoughts and you're being judgmental towards yourself. And so this is why um, I tend not to say to people, your thoughts, um, your, your thoughts create your reality. Your thoughts bring you your reality. I tend not to say that. And the big reason I tend not to say that is because when I was going through cancer at that time, the law of attraction was huge. It was something that everybody was talking about. And I cannot tell you the number of people that would say to me, you attracted the cancer, your thoughts attracted the cancer, negative thoughts attract a negative reality. I'm sure you've all heard that said. And so people were saying this to me and they were teaching me how I needed to watch my thoughts. So here's what happened. I started to fear my thoughts. And so I became even more fearful. I became fearful of the law of attraction because I was trying to figure out how did I attract something so horrendous? I've always believed that I am a positive person. I've always believed that I'm a good person. I've always tried to be a good person. How did I attract this? And it made me more fearful of my thoughts. And 
the more I would fear my thoughts, the, the worse my condition seemed to get. And so I started to get really, really um, <clears throat> confused and I went down this downward spiral of fear where I didn't trust anything I was thinking and I would try and force myself to think positive thoughts, which meant suppressing a part of myself, which made me feel even worse. But here's the clarity I got when I was in that NDE state. It's not about my thoughts. It's about who I am. So the only thing I need to do is to be myself fearlessly. The more you allow yourself to be who you are, the more you are sending yourself the message that I love myself, there's nothing wrong with me. So allow yourself to be authentic. And when you allow yourself to be authentic and be who you truly are, you are actually telling yourself, there's nothing wrong with my thoughts. I am human. Every now and then I do feel fear, but I have to allow it. Every now and then I do have a tinge of a negative thought. But if I start to judge that thought, and say it's bad to have these fearful negative thoughts, I then start to fear the thoughts. And so that's actually compounding it. So anyway, I've realized the idea is really to be who I am, to love who I am. And when you love who you are, you're, you manifest or you, um, you allow what is truly yours to come into your life. You then don't even have to watch your thoughts because you are being yourself, you are being authentic, um, you are loving yourself. And the only thing you need to do is that, is to know that you are deserving and worthy of good things. And that is what um, the area where you need to kind of think, okay, how can I love myself more? How can I, um, how can I allow myself to be more authentic? Um, where can I release fear? So it's not about watching your thoughts and being fearful of your thoughts. It's the other way. It's about, oh, okay, how can I love myself more? Um, and let me clarify this even further. If somebody is going through an illness or a sickness or a negative period in their lives, I will never, ever, ever say to them, you attracted this or your negative thoughts attracted this. That, that is the last thing I would say. I would never say to people, don't be so negative or um, negative thoughts attracted your reality. In fact, what I would say to someone who's going through pain and hurt or confusion or fear or an illness, any of those things, <clears throat> I would say to them, hey, this is an invitation for you to love yourself more. This is an invitation for you to allow more good things in your life. How can we do that? So in other words, instead of the focus being on your negative thoughts have attracted your reality, the focus is more on how can we love ourselves more? How can we find more joy in our, in our lives? What are the things that make you happy? I would actually help them to focus on the joy, the happiness, and on how to love themselves more so that they can be more authentic authentic because you attract who you really are. When you are joyful, then you allow more joyful things to come into your life. And the way to be more joyful is to love yourself more so that you're not so judgmental about your thoughts. And when you see a negative thought creeping in, you allow it. It's like, hey, it's a part of me. Let's see what it says. And then it'll leave when it's done. But when you suppress it and you say, oh my God, you know, I have to suppress this negative thought because it's going to attract a negative reality. What you're doing is you're suppressing a part of who you are and you're sending yourself the message that there are parts of me that are not lo lovable and I have to control them, which means I cannot be authentic. And that's not the message you want to send yourself. You want to send yourself the message all the time that I am lovable, I am worthy, I am deserving, I am loved. And that's the message you want to give other people who are struggling. You never want to say, hey, your negative thoughts created this and your thoughts create your reality. You don't want to say your thoughts create your reality when someone is going through something that's really painful or fearful. Um, you always want to bring them to a space where they're feeling more loved, always, always. And you're showing them that 
They need to learn to accept themselves more and love themselves more. That's how you shift them, not by getting them to fear their thoughts. Just remember, love is the answer to every single problem in the world. Love is the solution to everything. It really is. Um, and thank you for your comments. Before I go into the second part about the tip of the iceberg, I just want to say hi to some of you. Um, Margaret Saunders, thank you. you um, <clears throat> she says, your words have blessed my life so much. Um, thank you for that. And uh, I just love getting comments from you. There's M Margaret on the screen. Thanks for punching that up. Um, so now that this takes me to the second question. Oh, wait, before I go to the second question, let's punch this up on the screen. Uh, Massimo Mastrangello. Mastr I hope I pronounced your name right, Massimo. Um, so I haven't read this question yet, so it's the first time I'm reading it. Okay, Anita, so what if you have a huge, huge desire in life? Where does this desire come from and what should you do about it? Is it correct to try and focus on it with your thoughts, feelings, i.e. apply the law of attraction? That is a great question. So um, let me tell you my thoughts on this first. Um, when I was going through my illness, of course, the greatest desire I had was to get well. And during that time when I had this desire to get well, um, I started to do vision boards. And I would, at that time, it wasn't a digital vision board. This was back in 2005. Um, so it was a, actually a board, a cork board that I had purchased. And I would cut out pictures of people who are well and healthy and paste them and, and pin them on this cork board, which was great for a while. But when, <clears throat> when I didn't see it manifesting in my body, it got even more, I got even more fearful. Um, and so the thing about vision boards sometimes is that what I realized after, what I realized later is that when you create a vision board, when you focus on a desire, when you focus on a desire, you may be limiting what is in store for you. And sometimes when you don't see your desire manifesting in the way you want it to, you start to feel fear. And when you start to feel fear, it again sets you back. You lose that place of love. What I tend to tell people is that all you have to do is just be who you are. And I'm going to tell you more about that. The, your question is actually going to be answered in the second part of this video, which is about the tip of the iceberg, Massimo. But um, because it's, it, I'm so glad you asked that question because that is the question that is part of the second part of um, what I designed for this video. But what I realized was that when I died, and came back, I realized that the future that was actually in store for me, my higher self, my inner self, the part of me that manifested itself to be me in this life, had a destiny for me, a dharma for me, that was bigger than what I could imagine. Therefore, what I was actually putting down on that vision board was limited compared to what was in store for me. In other words, allowing my illness to manifest fully and then take me into the healing catapulted me into a different reality than what I could ever have imagined before. I hope I'm making sense, but what I'm trying to say is that right this moment, when you create your vision or your desire for your future, your vision is limited to what you can see or what you know right now. But maybe there is a future waiting for you that is greater than what you can imagine. And most of us are incapable of imagining something greater than what we currently know. And so the idea is to leave an open-ended future. And the way I leave an open-ended future is just by focusing on the now and how much, how authentic I am and how fearless I am in allowing what 
whatever the future has for me. So my only job is to love my current self and to find joy and in this current moment, do what brings me joy in this current moment so that I feel my most elevated self and as and just get to the most elevated self I can be. And as long as I am at that place, then the future that I allow to unfold will be my greatest future beyond what I can even imagine. And that's what I discovered, that whatever I put on those vision boards did not match the life I am experiencing today. I could not even have imagined the life I am experiencing today. I could not, I did not even know that such, a life experience, that such a life existed as the one I am living today. So don't limit yourself. Don't limit yourself with goals, with vision boards and things like that. Leave it open-ended. Your only job is to really find, is to express fully in this moment, to be fearless in this moment, to find your joy and your expanded self in this moment. And that's the next part of my, um, of what I'm sharing today is how do you do that? How do you do that? Okay. So here's the thing before I go into that, let's say hello to a few people. Um, let's speak, say hello to Biljana Sklor. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Um, thank you. Thanks for your comment. Thank you for sharing yours and Dr. Wayne Dyer's work. He is with us now. Yes, Bildina, he is so with us at this moment and so are all our other guides and the rest of our own self. So here's what I want to tell you about loving yourself or about being who you are or being yourself fully or finding your joy. The question that people have for me is, how do I do it? So firstly, it's not about how, it's about understanding who you are. You are the tip of an iceberg. What you can see, this physical body, this physical body that you see right now on the screen in front of you and your own, look down at your body, look down at your body and see it for what it is. And what I want you to realize is that this body is just the tip of an iceberg. You are actually much, much greater. I'm sure all of you have seen pictures if you just go on Google and, and just Google iceberg. And I'm sure all of you have seen pictures of icebergs where um, the, <coughs> excuse me, the bigger portion of the iceberg is below the water and you don't see it. You don't see the iceberg. About 80% of the iceberg is below the water and all you see is 20%. That's you. 80% of you is in the other realm. You can't see it with your physical eyes, but it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. And when I speak about six sensory beings or being aware of your six sensory self, it means being aware of that 80% that you cannot see. But the interesting people think, sorry, the interesting thing that most people don't realize is the part of you that you cannot see is actually bigger than the part of you that you can. So when I tell people love yourself, all they do is they love the tip of the iceberg, the self that they can see. So people will say, hey, I have massages, I go for my hair, I do work on myself, I take care of myself. How come um, you know, my life is still like it's such a struggle and how come I still don't feel I love yourself? The reason you don't feel you love yourself is because you're neglecting 80% of yourself. You're only loving 20% of yourself. So the first thing is to become aware that there is another 80% and to become aware that you are actually a six sensory being. And once you know that and you become aware of that, you then have to start to tune into that. Tune into that 80% because that's the bigger part of you. That's the part of you that knows your purpose. That's the part of you you need to love. And when you love that part of you, you get to a point where that part of you becomes integrated with the physical part of you. Right now, it feels like two separate things. You feel like you're just an iceberg lost floating in the ocean because you can't see what's underneath. That's why you feel lost. But if you could see the whole thing 
Hey, somebody's just said hello from Iceland. Yay, perfect. That's where all the icebergs are. So if you could see the whole thing, you would see that there is so much more that is below the surface and connected by the ocean to everything else. It's connected to the rest of the world. It's connected to the other icebergs. It's connected to the earth, the water, the elements. But that tip of the iceberg looks lost and lonely and isolated because that's all you can see. That's how you feel when you don't realize that what you are identifying with is only 20% of who you truly are. And when you become aware that you are so much greater and you get in touch with it, and the way I get in touch with it is by going out in nature. I talk to it. I get in touch with it when I'm lying in bed at night before I fall asleep. I talk to the rest of my iceberg. And that is the part you need to accept and love and know and, and trust. And so once you accept that, once you talk to it, once you nourish that part, which is your soul level, by acknowledging, yes, there's so much more to me. Yes, it's trying to guide me all the time. Yes, that's the part of me that knows my calling and why I'm here. It knows what's in store for me in my future. It's trying to call me to my future self. And once you start to get in touch, it talks to you like that. And then you stop feeling lost. That's truly what happens. That's truly what happened with me. And that's what the NDE did for me. It made me aware of the whole iceberg. And so that's what I invite you to do. I want you to start journaling. I want you to start getting in touch with yourself. And here's what happens. When you are in touch with the entire iceberg, you become integrated, you become whole. You stop feeling the need to even love yourself because there's no self to love. The part that you're trying to love now integrates with the bigger part of you and you realize, oh my God, I get it. I don't have to focus on loving myself because there's no self, there's no physical self. I am part of this eternal self. I'm part of this greater, uh, this greater entity, which is the whole iceberg, which is connected to the whole universe. And it has all the answers to everything. So when I sit in quiet meditation, when I go out in nature, when I'm having my shower, I get my answers. So here's the difference. The type of law of attraction that does not work is the type where you go outside of yourself for answers, where you think you're the tip of the iceberg and you go to other tips of icebergs to get your answers. Um, and we do this all the time by comparing ourselves. And we think taking care of ourselves means listening to the outside world, to what advertisers tell us we need to do. But in actuality, it's about listening not to the outside world. It's about listening to our inner world. It's about listening to that 80% of us, that iceberg that is not visible to the outside world. That's what it is. And when you start listening to that part of you, that's when your life unfolds in the way that it's meant to. That's when you, um, you really start to listen to who you are and you know, even when people cross over, you know that they don't cross over um, before their time. They listened to their whole self and they realized, now it's the time for me to pass. Now it's the time for me to go. You realize that when somebody dies, they haven't lost a battle. They haven't left early. They've left because the rest of their work now is on the other side. So I hope that made sense to you. And also um, um, what I want to say is when it comes to illnesses and things like that, our medical paradigm also only looks at the tip of the iceberg. We think of illness only when it manifests on that tip of the iceberg because that's the part of us that's the physical body. 
but we forget to look at the other 80% of us. So my dream, my aim, my wish someday is for this planet to, for us to change our medical system and to change our hospitals to become healing sanctuaries where we are able to see the person as the whole iceberg, the other 80%, to see what's going on in that 80%. Have they suppressed it? Have they neglected following their dharma, <clears throat> their intuition, their calling? Is that why it's manifesting as an illness at the tip of their iceberg? I would love to manifest or uh, figure out technology that can help people to see what's happening in their whole self and not just the current medical technology which only gauges what's happening in our physical self which is the tip of the iceberg. So um, let's go to a couple of questions. Um, so I thank you. There's, I have a comment from Darren Hunt. Thank you Darren. Uh, he says, I am so grateful that Wayne Dyer planted the seed and let Anita Morjani grow and flourish. Thank you, Anita, for planting the seed of self-love to heal so many. Thank you so much, Darren. That's, that's such a sweet note. Um, let's go into a few other great questions. So my intrepid husband, Danny, who was so amazing on this video two weeks ago and attracted so many people to, to, um, to tune into him and to know the person behind the camera, I want you to know that everything we do everything even the people who work with me and my team they all do it because they believe in the message it's not just a job it's more um, i only want to work with people who really believe in the message because that's how i work um, <clears throat> so we have a question from maria carvajal cabrera i hope i pronounced your name correctly maria um, you say can i speak to the rest of the iceberg with my child can we speak each morning and at night together? Oh my God, of course you can. That is the best thing you can do. So the best thing you can do with your children is to make them aware that their physical body is just the tip of the iceberg and that there is so much more to them than what they can physically see. There is so much more. If a child is getting bullied at school, not only is it just the tip of the iceberg that's being bullied and they need to get in tune with their whole self, they also need to realize that the bully is only coming from the tip of their iceberg. They're coming from a place of weakness. There is so much more to that person um, and they don't realize it. They don't see their greatness. So they need to diminish others in order to feel great. That's basically what a bully does. Um, we uh, I have a question from Var Maria Chanel. We can punch it up on the screen. How can we know that we uh, that we are this bigger self that you talk about? Couldn't it just be an escape into a fantasy self? I really have trouble seeing and knowing myself as more than these tangible twenty percent. I guess all I can ask you is to try is to try talking to yourself. I mean. Um, let me put it this way. Um, actually, so let me put it this way. I'm, I'm trying to think of how to articulate it in a way to really get it across. Um, when I first came back from the near death experience, I realized that everything I had been taught to believe ran counter. It ran completely opposite to what uh, I needed to know and believe in order to live a healthy, happy life. And the main thing being this, that we are actually six sensory beings and our sixth sense is actually the bigger part of us. It's the 80% part of us. And whereas we have been taught that we are only 20%. So here we are, um, a hundred percent of us trying to squeeze ourselves into believing that we are just that 20 percent tip of the iceberg that's why we're so messed up that's why this world is so messed up we are six sensory maybe we're ten sensory beings so if that iceberg is a hundred if that um, iceberg is a hundred percent but we only see 20 percent that means maybe we're ten sensory beings being squeezed into believing that we're five sensory beings um, and that's why we struggle so I realized everything I had been taught to believe ran counter to what I discovered as being true when I was on the other side when I came back and I started sharing with people 
um, people said to me um, that how can we believe you? What if you're being delusional? What if it's not true? It can't be true. How can so many people be wrong? The other thing that makes it really hard for people to believe in is because everything I'm saying runs counter to the dominant paradigm. And so I did experience ridicule. I did experience naysayers. I did experience people um, uh, debunking me. I experienced all of that. Believe me, I did when I came back in 2006. And very shortly after that, I stopped sharing because I wanted to shout it out from the rooftops. I wanted people to stop feeling the pain and feeling restricted into this little 20% uh, beings that we've become. And But because I got all this blowback, I thought, huh, maybe I'm not meant to be sharing. Maybe the world is not ready. So instead, I made myself into a little hermit, moved out of my community, moved out away from people that knew me, moved away from the community where that normal thinking that we are just this physical being was the dominant paradigm. I moved away from that and uh, we moved into a little village where nobody knew us, away from the city. And I decided to live, to walk my talk, to live my life the way I had learned it. And I saw it pan out in different, in ways that are beyond what I could put on a vision board, way beyond. I did all those things by communicating with my higher self, my 80% self, by, um, and by not taking on things from the place of fear, like taking a job I hate just to pay the bills. I started to follow my calling. Um, money is not the reason why I do things, but I am taken care of. Um, the universe takes care of me with abundance because I am, um, I am doing things from a place of a desire. For me, success means doing things that, um, that serve me and serve people, other people. It has to be something that enriches me, otherwise I can't sustain it. And when I say enriches me, I mean everything from energetically, uh, spiritually and financially. It has to do that so that you can be, your batteries can be charged so that you can keep doing what you're doing, so that you can serve people, but you can serve people from a place of strength. Uh, I used to believe that it was selfish to nourish myself and take care of myself and to come from that place. So anyway, I literally had to remove myself from a dominant paradigm to put my own truths into practice because otherwise I knew that the danger of trying to convince people who don't believe you is that you might end up being convinced that what you believe is not true and you might end up going back to the way you used to be. And I didn't want that to happen. So I removed myself. And over the years, I saw my life pan out in magical ways that I couldn't have imagined. Um, doesn't mean I didn't struggle. Of course I did. I struggled with finances. And then as soon as I discovered that next layer of the iceberg, it was like, it blew open. Wayne Dyer discovered my story. Um, I struggled with different things, you know, things like even um, menial things like visa issues and things. But again, as soon as I let go and let the universe do its work, um, things blew open even better than I expected. So it doesn't mean you don't struggle. But when you are following your guidance and your calling and you're in touch with the, with the rest of your iceberg, your struggles and challenges open you up to the next level. Now I understand what my dad meant when he said to go and live your life fearlessly. It means to always be yourself fearlessly, regardless of the challenges, regardless of the struggles, regardless of the naysayers, regardless of the people that um, debunk you. Always be yourself uh, always be yourself fearlessly. That's what he meant about being yourself fearlessly. It's not about trying to be what everyone else wants you to be to fit in to the dominant paradigm. And um, I really had to put that into practice. Anyway, today I wouldn't trade anything and the way my life has panned out and meeting Wayne Dyer in 2011 and everything that's happened since then, um, it wouldn't have happened if I didn't 
um, if I didn't believe in what I believe in, if I didn't do it the way I, I do it, it wouldn't have happened. And in fact, when I wrote the book, What If This Is Heaven? I just want to um, mention this because it might help some people. When I wrote this book, What If This Is Heaven? Uh, the reason for writing this is actually to tell people that this can be heaven if you knew who you truly are. The original subtitle was, so the title was, What If This Is Heaven? And the original subtitle I had for it was, If It Is, Then Why Does It Sometimes Feel Like Hell? But a lot of people advised me that don't put hell in the title of your book. So we changed the subtitle to, How Are Cultural Myths Prevent Us From Experiencing Heaven on Earth? And so the idea behind the book was to tell you how all these beliefs are actually the opposite. They run counter the, the beliefs you have, the beliefs you've been taught. They run counter to your actual truth. And it really is about living life from the inside out, not from the outside in, which is what you have been taught. And the dominant paradigm will always tell you, believe what you see, believe um, with your eyes, believe what you can touch, believe what you can materially prove. They will always tell you that. What you're missing out on is 80% of your reality, which is not part of this five sensory paradigm. That's what I talk about in what if this is heaven and how your beliefs are working against you. Um, so yeah, you know, if uh, people ask me, What's the difference between my first two books? The first book, Dying to Be Me, is actually about my near-death experience. It's about my life story and the NDE itself and what I experienced on the other side. The second book is about trying to apply that when I came back and realizing that, hey, I believe very differently from the dominant paradigm, but I don't want to go back to being the person I used to be because that was the person I got that got cancer. So it was about trying to be this person and trying to live it without letting the debunkers convince me to go back, going back to being that person. And today, those same people that were challenging me come to me and say, oh my God, I want what you have. I want to live life the way you do. The thing is, yeah, I guess, you know, you have to be a little bit delusional to live life that way and to experiment because soon when you start to experiment and to speak to your higher self, when you start to call, call your higher self into your life and integrate it, um, your higher self, that 80% is actually connected to everything. It has access to everything. And as you start to do it, you uh, what happens is it starts to get com comfortable coming through you. And it happens more and more, so much so that it's undeniable. If you watch even some of my past videos, like even the one I did last week with Gerilyn, who lost her son, and now she's getting signs from her son that are just unmistakable. And she is getting, she is having an amazing relationship where she is now really understanding that this is how it was meant to be. He was, he was struggling and now he's fine. He's so happy now. And this is how it was meant to be. And it's taking her to a whole new level of her life. This is why I can't, um, I can't recommend it strongly enough for you to really start opening up and communicating to your higher self. Let's go to another question from, let's open up to Martha McGee. Hi, Martha. Um, Martha says, Hi, Anita. Please speak about how to overcome debilitating chronic illness for those who are suffering and feeling hopeless. Oh, I, I always, I know it's, it's always really hard to see people who are suffering. And what I would encourage those who are going through debilitating um, illnesses is to really develop their own personal practice of connecting with their higher self. Um, I don't like to give people dogma and one of the reasons I don't like that is that when you're going through an illness and if I say this is what you have to do in five steps, you have to wake up at six, you have to meditate, blah, blah, blah. What happens is that when people miss it, when they don't do it, they start to feel fear that, oh my gosh, my illness is going to be worse. I say this because that's what used to happen to me when I was going through illness and people would give me 
specific instructions. This is what you have to do. This is what you have to eat. This is blah, blah, blah. And so when I, so I would try and do it, but it would add an extra pressure and an extra stress to an already stressful life of living with a chronic illness. So what I want you to do if you're living with a chronic illness, I want you to start doing things that alleviate pressure and stress in your life. Um, and so start to ask yourself, what are the things in my life right now that I don't want to do, but I'm doing, <clears throat> excuse me, because I'm feeling it's an obligation or because I'm too fearful to say no. I want you to make a list of those things. And I want you to figure out um, painless and kind ways to start eliminating those from your life because you need to do that because your illness may even be your body's way of saying it's time to take care of yourself. So start to eliminate the things that are causing you stress and pressure. That is the first thing to do if you're facing a debilitating il illness um, or anything like that. The second thing to do is to start learning to receive receive good things in life, receive from people. It's time for you to receive. You've been giving and giving long enough and chances are that's what led to the illness. So start to learn to receive. The third thing is to create your own practice of self-love and connection with your higher self, one that works for you. Um, I don't want to give you more dogma and more stuff to follow. Create one that works for you, something like um, waking up at a specific time in the morning that works for you and making something for you that's nourishing to eat and then spending 30 minutes connecting with your higher self, listening to music, going out in nature, create some kind of a ritual or something that works for you. And when you practice this ritual, tell yourself, I am on the path to healing. And during this practice, connect to your higher self. But be aware that you are connecting to your higher self and be aware that this practice that you are developing unique for you is taking you on the path to healing. That's what I would do if I was going through an illness right now. Um, we have a comment from Valerie Hopko uh, Turker. Let's punch that up on the screen. Thank you, Valerie. Um, I am planning on using your children's book in my fourth grade classroom for Valentine's Day. Oh, thank you. My children's book is illustrated by the beautiful Angie DeMuro, and um, it's, uh, it's called Love, a story about who you truly are. And so we put that together really just to help children because people keep asking me, um, how can I make sure that my children know how to love themselves? And so Angie actually put together the, these beautiful illustrations. She's a talented um, artist, graphic artist, and so it's just a, a lovely book. I'll put a link to it in the, in the comments. And, um, and Kelly, Kelly Backhouse, Thank you for your comment. Um, we can put it up on the screen. Thank you, Kelly. She says, I'm distracted by the beautiful light around you. For many years, I've been able to see the energy outside of people. I believe we all can and, and, and encourage your lis listeners to look for it. Thank you, Kelly. Yes, we all have this beautiful energy around us. And, um, and thank you for bringing that up because that's another thing is we all have life force energy. And when you are doing things from a place of fear, from a place of obligation, you're actually shrinking your energy. So I always tell people consciously look for things that make you feel love and make you feel joy. So thank you for bringing that up. Look for things that make you feel love, joy, spend time with children, with your pets, and that'll increase your energy immediately. It'll increase your life force energy. I love doing this, these videos connecting with you. And so for me, that in increases my energy. Um, and we have a question from Christina Floria. Let's put that up. Christina says, how can you escape your inner fears so that you can stop putting, an, uh, putting on obstacles by yourself? Gosh, I wish you were here in front of me. I would ask you more details about that question. Um, 
Now, fears usually come from the outside, even though you may feel that these are inner fears because they're fears in your mind. But let me tell you that when you go deep enough, there is only love, only love. And truly, this is the truth. It means you're not going deep enough. Fears are only from the outside world. The outside world is a space of duality and currently it's the outside, our outside, current outside reality of what's happening in the world right now is at an imbalance where it's being run more by fear than love. And a lot of you who are empaths, you're feeling it more. And because you're feeling it within you, it feels like they are inner fears. But believe me, they are being triggered by the outside world. If you were truly able to shut out the outside world for a while, if you are feeling this deep inner fear, you need to shut out the outside world. You need to shut out the news. You need to shut out, even take time out from people who are triggering these fears. And you need to get in touch with your inner self, the rest of that iceberg that's connected to the universe and your fears will dissipate and you will start to get more clarity of your purpose. When you have more clarity of your purpose and your calling, the fears affect you less. Um, the fears of your outside world become, um, become less powerful to you because you have a calling, you have something to follow, you have a beacon or a light to follow. So what you need to do if you are haunted by fears is to find time away from the outside world um, and to get deeper into your inner world. And although our purpose here, your purpose of being in a physical body is to be very much in this physical world. However, we can get imbalanced and we can get pulled too much by the fears, which means you need to balance that and go inward and become drawn again by the love that is the inner part of you, the other part of you, the other side. And you need to get back in touch with the calling and the intention and the love that drew you forth into this world. Um, let's go to um, a question from Michelin Callan. Hi, Michelin. Um, let's pull that up. Thank you. Michelin is one of the angels that works in the for, from healing to from healing to whole group. It's the group for people who are hurting and in need of support. Thank you for mentioning that. Sometimes, <clears throat> sometimes I hesitate to mention the group and I'm so happy you mentioned it because I worry about you guys getting a flood of people coming in, but let's do it. I have a Facebook group and I will put the link in, in the comments. It's called From Healing to Whole. They're ready to receive you guys. So any of you going through deep, um, any going through health challenges, debilitating health challenges, deep spiritual, emotional challenges, join this group. It's where healers and those who need healing come together uh, to, to help each other and support each other. If you are a healer listening in, if you have something to give and you have time you want to share, please also join this group. So I'm going to put a link. So please check it out. Please join and, um, it's a beautiful group where angels go in to heal other people and those who need healing are in there receiving healing. It's a group where you need to learn to receive because you're deserving and worthy. Um, we, I have a question from Sergeja Ice. I hope I've pronounced your first name correctly. Uh, let's punch it up on the screen. And Sergeja asks how to not be so much of fears of everything, anxiety, panic, and be down with energy. Thanks. Love you, Anita. Thank you. I love you too. The way to not be so fearful is to shift your focus to love. And for me, it means getting in touch with my inner self, getting in touch with my inner iceberg, if you like to call it that, um, getting in touch with that higher self. And loving myself really means loving that whole me. And as I said, most people think loving yourself means just loving that tip of the iceberg. It means loving the whole you and the part of you um, that is in touch with, with everything. And when you, um, when you are in touch with that, that's when the fears dissipate. That's when your focus shifts. So it is really about shifting your focus. Um, 
Another question that keeps coming up from time to time is people ask me a little bit about my events and they want to know more about what goes on in my events. A question that came up that was written to me is like, say, for example, on the seven day cruise, what happens on the cruise? What do we do for seven days? Or I'm doing a couple of five day events in, um, uh, in Multiversity in Scotts Valley and also at the Omega. So what happens at these events? So here's what happens at many of these events. Um, we are away from our environment, just like what I said it <clears throat> is really helpful. It's very helpful when you're away from your environment and you're away from what I call the dominant paradigm, the dominant belief system. And so we are, sub, um, we are immersed in an experiential journey with like-minded people who are supporting each other. We create an atmosphere where healing can take place because what we do is we, we actually get in touch with the whole of us, that six, seven, eight, nine, ten, sen ten sensory self that we truly are. And we are in a safe environment where we can experience it, feel it, talk about it, share with each other so that it, we can know that we're not imagining it. Imagine being with people who also feel it with you so that you know, hey, this is really true. I'm not crazy. It's just that the people who are out there, they don't see it. They don't feel it. That's why many of them are struggling. And we don't judge the people who don't feel it because um, what's to judge? They're the ones, they're, they're struggling. They're having a hard time. The way for them to actually start to believe it is for them to see how our lives change from having this experience. So at these events, I also take you through your own near-death experience. We do it through music and sound healing, and we simulate a near-death experience where we have you visualizing that you meet loved ones and that you realize what your purpose is. And then when you come back, you have this renewed energy to go to um, a renewed energy and a renewed purpose for living your life again. We also uh, speak about things like what is your purpose, how to discover your purpose. And those of us in the group that are going through specific challenges, we all harness our energy together to help you heal those challenges. We also journal during that time. You also get quiet time to reflect on what took place, what happened, what what shifted, what insights you have, what awakenings you've had. You get quiet times to reflect it and journal it. And then we get time to come together as a group to discuss it and share it so that we can actually embed it into ourselves and know that other people had the same experience. So it wasn't just me. It wasn't just my imagination. That's the kind of thing that takes place. We do um, at the retreats, we do evening meditations, sometimes early morning meditations where we come together so that our energies can be aligned together and we can uplift like a collective energy. And it starts with healing from the self. All of us, all of us are healing each other. And I help to actually help you to bring that energy together and to get it as high as possible. Um, we hold that space so that everybody can feel a level of healing. And so people can even feel, what does it feel like to be healed? Because one of the issues I have with our current medical paradigm, doctors are very well-meaning. They're very well-meaning. They're great people. They go in with the intention of helping people. But most of the patients there, they are being immersed in um, what it means to be sick because our um, our paradigm, our medical paradigm focuses on illness. It focuses on searching for illness. These are the symptoms for illness. This is what you need to look for. This is what it feels like to be ill. Nobody tells you what it feels like to be well and energized and connected. That's what we want to show you. That's what I want to show you and what I want to create so that you have a sample, an example of what it feels like and we hold that the longer we're together five days seven days in a space away from your environment out in nature whether it's out in the ocean on a cruise or out in the in the forest 
Um, if we are together, the longer we are together, the longer we can hold that space. So you know what it is in you to feel and to look for when you go back to your home environment. You then want to be able to carry that with you so that you can uplift the people around you instead of you then, um, instead of you then going back to the way you used to be, trying to be what everyone else wants you to be. So in other words, the longer you're in that space, the more you can, you know what it feels like and it's been embedded in you, it becomes a habit, so you can take it with you and you can uplift the people around you. So that's basically the idea behind my retreats and why I have rolled out these retreats, these retreats where I want to be with you for longer periods of time. Having said that, I also do have one day workshops happening next year in Germany, in London, and a few different places. So please, um, please check out my events. I love doing the live events because that's where we really get to play with energies and holding that space and watching people have their aha moments and their insights and sharing it with each other and giving each other permission to share what, who we really are with no judgment whatsoever. So that's, yeah, I get excited just talking about it. Um, let's go to, I think we have time for one final um, question. And that is from Ark. Hey, I hope you I hope I pronounced your name correctly, Ark. Um, she asks, when is your movie releasing? Can't wait for that. I need to listen to this every day as my daily vitamin dose. Thanks for being such an amazing person. I know now how important and and loved I am after being bullied and loved in and lived in fear for ages. I am free now. Yes, you're free. Thank you. Thank you for saying that. I get it. Your name is probably Archie, A-R-C-H-I-E. I got it now. <laughs> and yes, you are free now. You know, as for the movie with Hollywood, you just never know. So I am just waiting to see when it comes out and whenever it comes out, it's perfect. Thanks for asking for that. And yes, the idea is to become free. It really is to become free. And that is one of the things that... Um, I keep saying over and over, even if you were to come to my, um, even if you are to come to my events, what I want to do is I, I want you to realize that whatever it is that you experience, it's yours. It's about you feeling empowered yourself. And, and it's just, and it's about doing it in a safe arena and it's about embedding it in you. And uh, thank you. Uh, there's a message from Likey Lily jo Johansson. I'm luck so lucky to see you in Bristol soon. Yay, yes, I'll be speaking in Bristol. I love Bristol. It's such a spiritual little city or town. I love speaking in places like that, that are low density and small uh, or out in the ocean or in the woods or somewhere where we really Ha can raise our energy to the level that we create and we choose. Um, somebody by the name of um, ah, Lizzie and Gary Spain says, will you be coming to Australia? You know, I would love to come to Australia. I really would. So many people write and say, will you be coming to Australia? I would like to come to Australia in 2020, but there is nothing that's been... Um, on that's firmed on the cards yet. I'm waiting for, uh, see, so here's the thing. When I do events and I do a lot of them, like 2019 is already pretty full and I get a lot of requests for events. But when I do events, I'm not the one organizing the event. It's always a event organizer, a promoter. It's, it's a third party. Um, so when a third party approaches me and says, I would like to organize an event for you in this country. And then my team talks to them and if it's viable and feasible, it's a go. So I'm still waiting for somebody from Australia to say, hey, I'd like to organize an event for you in Sydney or Brisbane or Melbourne. And that's what hasn't happened yet. All of you beautiful people who've read my book and watched my videos, so many of you have said, come to Australia, come to Australia. And oh my God, with all my heart, I want to come to Australia. I love Australia, but I haven't yet had a promoter event organizer come to me and say, 
I would, I really want to organize an event for you in Australia. So there you have it. That's the reason I haven't spoken in Australia for a couple of years. When I went there, it was with Wayne Dyer and the event was organized um, for Wayne Dyer and I was his guest speaker. So um, I think we're coming up to time now. Um, Gabriella asks, any retreats in Europe? Where can we check the events, please? You can check the events on my website at www.anitamurjani.com slash events. I would like to have some retreats in Europe. I have some wonderful people, uh, event organizers in Europe, um, one who lives in Croatia, one who lives in Basel, who will be organizing some retreats in Europe for me further down the line. Unfortunately, 2019 is already pretty full for me with retreats. I have a lot going on. Um, so no, no retreats in Europe at the moment. I have a full day event in Germany in March. But um, if you can come down to the States, I would love to see you, um, whether it's for the cruise or one of the other retreats. So thank you so much for tuning in. Please tune in um, to my video next week. I'll be back next Sunday. Um, with a bit of luck, I can convince Danny to hop in as a guest. And uh, thank you again. And check out my website there. Check out my other YouTube videos. Many of the questions you ask have been answered in my other videos. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel. It actually helps me a lot when you subscribe or when you subscribe to my newsletter or my YouTube channels. It helps me because what happens is that um, I often get people writing to me, asking me questions about where I'll speak or whether I've spoken about a topic, which I have already spoken about. But if you subscribe, you will actually get notifications when I'm speaking about those topics. So thank you so much again. Have a wonderful week and I'll see you all next week. Bye.